as always, it's such a pleasure to be among you. I'm always excited yes. um, to just bring the word. And, and so, you guys ready? Yeah. yeah. Cold red, cold red, cold red. When you hear those words, what comes to mind? Emergency. Emergency. What else? Danger. Say that again. Danger. Danger. Life or death. Life or death. <laughs> so there's emergency happening today in the midst of chaos, in the midst of the kingdom. There's yes. some internal spiritual bleeding occurring that we must address, that we must take care of, and that we must get healed from. So let's take our eyes, our eyes, our heart and mind to God's word in the book of Hebrews. So it's all turned to the book of Hebrews. You guys enjoy that little dramatic intro? <laughs> because it's real. It's real what's happening. We have to take this. We sometimes have a tendency to take it lightly. And God is like, this is important stuff. This real stuff that happens. So we're going to start in um, we're going to start in the third chapter in the book of Hebrews. Verse 7. And it reads So, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me, and for 40 years saw what I did. This is why I was angry with that generation. And I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger. They shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly to the end, the confidence we had at first, as has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt and with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert, and to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest? If not to those who disobey, so we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Therefore, since the promise of entering in his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because those who did because of those who heard did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said. So I declared on my oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day and these words. And on the seventh day God rested from all his works. And again in the passage above he says, they shall never enter my rest. It still remains that some will enter that rest, and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore, God again set a certain day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke to David, as was said before. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. 
For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. And finally, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. Amen? Amen. So today, our topic, our study, our focus, and our healing comes from the title, Entering into God's Rest. Entering into God's rest. So I want to ask you, when you hear the word rest, what's your definition of rest? I want to hear from you. What's your definition of rest? When you hear that word, what do you think of? What meaning does it have for you in your life? Say that again.
We do it, and even I was talking to Pastor Kai, who's my mentor, and she asked me a question. She said, why is it that rest always comes up once you're depleted? And I was like, Lord, why is that? It's because I haven't made rest a priority. I haven't, and as I was doing this, I was like, Lord, I am implementing that into my life. I got to talk to my husband, though. I haven't talked to him. But I got to talk to my husband, but we need to go back to implementing, or which day it would be, implementing that day where it's just a day of rest because it's so important. And so in both, rest is important in both the form of a verb, which is the action of rest, and a noun, which is a place of rest. And so the goal of today's message is for us to, one, understand the meaning and the significance of rest, two, to analyze our lifestyle, and finally, three, for us to receive healing in that area if we haven't been, as we all kind of shook our heads in the beginning. So first, let's look at our text. And it's, it's so important that it spans from chapter three all the way to chapter four. And I love it because when I teach, I always, you know, sometimes I'm like, should I pick out a verse? And sometimes God's like, no, because we don't spend enough time reading it. And so I just love it. I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm going to read all of it because we need to hear it. And so um, when we look at first verse, I mean, chapter 3, verse 7, and it goes all the way to 411. But in verse 7, it's telling us, the first verse is telling us and reminding us of the words of the Holy Spirit, are with which are referenced from other scriptures. So in verse 7, it says reminder. It's a reminder of what the Holy Spirit spoke to us. And in verses 8 to 11, it, it um, references different scriptures that are found throughout the, the Bible. A lot which comes from n numbers when the Israelites wandered for 40 years because of their disobedience. A lot from the, um, from the Psalms 95, which it talked a lot about resting and walking into, into God's um, rest. And so all these verses in verse 11, 8 through 11 are all references of something, of scriptures from somewhere else that God has already told us. It talks about hearts being hardened because of disobedience. It, it gives us, 8 through 11 gives us a warning about what happened. And it gives us the example because that's how we learn best. We got to see it. And so God knows that we got to see it. He talks to that fleshly place that we have that we have to see it. And he's like, okay, well, let me tell you then. Since you don't want to just believe me because I said it, but let me remind you of what happened to that group who didn't listen to me, whose hearts were very hardened to me. And so he warns us. What happens when our hearts become hardened? That we no longer are able to hear and really live by God's word because we're thinking about ourselves. And then verses 12 through 19 can be summed up from verse 19, which says, in verse 19, it says, So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. And as I was studying, this word unbelief kept coming up. And we've been talking about it. But it's because we are, there's still parts of us in our hearts that are unbelieving God. And that's why so much is happening in our lives because we're not living by faith. We're not truly believing what his word says. And so then as we enter into chapter four, after having, getting the reference from the past and other scriptures, he goes on to telling us about the promise of God, that the promise of God still exists. The promise of God to enter into his rest. Because that group in the Old Testament, they didn't get to enter into his promise. But God is so good. God is so just that his promise of, to us of entering to rest still exists. And we have to be careful not to miss it. And so here we're referenced to Hebrews 12 and 15, which is about missing out due to bitterness causing root in our hearts. And so, again, that thing is important. Our heart is important, that we got to take care of it. And so, but the difference, and it explains to us that the difference between us and the people in the Old Testament is now that we have been, is now we have been saved by grace, and we now have faith to combine what we've heard. Because we've seen it, God has, Jesus has came, he saved us, and so now in verses 4 and 5, there's a reference of the Sabbath and resting in the same manner that God rested. And so it tells us that's why we should do it, because God told us to do it, and it's the same way that he does it. Then you go down to 6, and verses 6 through 11, 
and who reminds us again of what happened in the past and tells us to make the most of each day, to rest in the Sabbath and in the final scripture, giving us our command of making every effort to enter the rest of God so that we will not follow an example of what? Verse 11. What, what did they do that we should not supposed to follow? Their example of dis disobedience. So here we're looking at how important it is. And so today we're going to be talking about entering into God's rest. And in order to enter into God's rest, there's four things that we're going to talk about. It's trust, community, relax, and release. And so first, let's see, what, is, what does the Bible say about rest? Because we've got to understand it. And so in four, in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Therefore, the sense of promise of entering into his rest still stands. And so in this verse, and, and so there's two different things that are happening in these, in these passages. There's a rest that has to do with the place, which is entering into his rest, into his dwelling. And to hit into habitating the way that God, in God's way, in Him. It's a noun and it's a place. And then again in verse 4 is an example of the second type of rest, which verse 4 says, For somewhere He has spoken about the seventh day in these words, and on the seventh day God rested from all His work. And this rest is a verb. In this scripture, it means to cause to cease. I pause to refrain from, to rest, to be still, a quiet abode. So this is how we are to rest in these two ways. In a way where everything, like I said for me, everything shut down. I wasn't thinking about work. I wasn't thinking about what I had to do. I was just resting. And then it talks about resting in him. But how do we rest in him? How do we allow ourselves to be still? Well, the first is we have to trust. It talks about belief. So in verse 3, verse 19, it says that, and it gives us an example, the reason why the Israelites weren't able, they didn't enter into God's rest, is because they did not believe. They didn't trust what he said. And I always like, and I always, when I like to give examples, I always think about kids, and I think it's easy for us to see because as adults, we get to this place where, you know, we know better than the kids, and so we, you know, and so it's easier for us to understand. So think about the kids, when a child. When you tell a child to do something and they disobey, why is it that they're disobeying? Because they feel like they know better. Because they think they know better than you. And so that's what happens, that we're, what we're doing to God when we don't really trust him, is that we're saying, God, I know you told me to do that thing, but... I don't really need you because I know better. That's the <clears throat> When we disobey, we're really telling God, I don't need you because I know better. Do you want to tell God that? No. So we have to realize what we're doing and the meaning that it has for God. Because we're going about our day, we're going about our life, and things are happening, and we're not realizing that it's because we really got some unbelief in our heart that we haven't dealt with. So when we're not obedient to God, we're being like the Israelites who are never going to be able to enter into God's rest. So there's no rest in your life because there's so much turmoil because you're trying to do everything on your own. And so belief in God's word is the key thing to being able to rest. Just as unbelief is the reason why men fall, fail to enter into God's rest. So we have to trust that God will take care of things. We have to trust that if we let go, God is still going to do it because that's what his word says. So we come here. We come here on Saturdays and some on Wednesday because we're saying what we're believing, but yet our walk isn't a reflection of the things that are coming out of our mouth, which means that our what's really is within our heart that we really don't believe. So we have to check ourselves. Then we have to trust because a lot of us feel like, oh, if I rest, if I sit still, if I'm not doing anything, then the world's going to stop spinning. And I know I've been guilty of it, especially at work. I'm like, no, I can't take a day off. This is my take a day off. Everybody's going to be doing this, and they're going to need me, and da 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 God, so who is, who's in charge of the world, you or God? If you stay, if you take a day off and rest, 
if you allow your mind to really truly just rest, is the world going to stop spinning and turning? No. But that's how we act. And so then we, we think we're going to lose something. But what I found, just as I found with tithing, that earlier in my walk, there would be times that I would pay my tithes and I would have all the money in the world. Then there'd be that one time where I forgot to pay him first and I started paying all my other bills and then I didn't have any money. And it's the same, and I'm like, well, it's just, that's how it happens. It also, I heard an example talk about Chick-fil-A. Their motto is that they rest on Sunday. And guess what? They make two times more off a of profit than any other fast food chains in their market. Double. And they close. <laughs> and they close every Sunday. I think the statistic said that they make about, <coughs> let's say, three to four million per store, whereas the next closest is McDonald's and they only make two million. And they open 24 hours a day. And the quality. <laughs> and the quality is better. So that's what we have to realize is that we're not going to lose because if God is creator, if God is provider, if God is over everything, then we have to realize that us taking the time to sit back, we're not going to lose anything. But again, it goes to trusting. It goes to having faith and knowing that he's going to take care of whatever needs that we have to do. But it's important because God says it's important to rest, then I have to make sure that I'm rested because it's a matter of disobedience or obedience. And since the Garden of Eden, when sin entered into the world, it's made us more tense and unable to relax. And when that veil came off, then we're always worried about, okay, how am I doing it? Or I'm going to do it my way because it's so it's been a struggle. So we have to realize it and know and going back to that's what we have to fight against. We have to put up a fight. We have to stay strong. We have to stay diligent. We have to put on the full armor. We have to truly, truly trust in him and believe that his word is what it says that it is. The second thing in resting is that we have to realize that we have to be a part of a community. And so in verse 313, it says, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that as none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So here it's telling us we need each other. It's a community. It's important that we uplift one another and encourage one another. Why? Because there are things that we may not be able to see. There are times when we start slipping that our brothers and sisters can catch it. And so we need that encouragement. And the thing that was like wow to me is that, you know, a lot of times we might do check-ins with people once a week, once a month. But this scripture is telling us that daily we have to encourage and check in with one another. Why? Because each day is a different day. We might do great in one day, and then the next day we might feel something out and we start to slip. And so that's what happens is that, so because we're not checking in daily with each other, and I know myself is guilty of that, I don't check in daily, or I don't even allow myself to be checked in with daily. Because that's not happening, each day that we're not checking in, we're slipping more and more from, from God. And so he tells us that in order to rest, we have to check in daily with each other. We have to trust and believe that we have that accountability will allow us to see things that we can't see. We have to, and we, it's important for us as a kingdom to watch for those who are drifting. Because we have to hold ourselves up. Because, again, we're a body. So if the eye is not working properly, then our body is not going to be able to move. So it's important for us to watch for those who are drifting. Then the third word in realizing rest is relaxing. And so relax means to become loose or less firm, to have a milder manner, to be less stiff. You think about, like, you know, you hold, if you like make a muscle, then let it go. That's the relaxing feeling. And a lot of us are walking through life tensed up. Yes, yes, yes. Because we aren't letting go. And so the Bible speaks quite highly of rest because it's rest of peaceful living. God promises that we can go into his place of rest. And so this is where the rest becomes the place. Where are you allowing your life to be dwelled? Where are you habitating? And we're always striving to fight to make ourselves acceptable to God. Yes. So when you're fighting, there's no rest in fighting. And so when we give our lives to God, when we allow ourselves to be fully over to Christ, 
That's when the rest should happen. That's when we don't have to struggle with our flesh. We just give it to him or struggle with those things that are trying to uh, hold us back. And we no longer have to be ashamed of ourselves. We no longer have to feel like we are not accepted or that we're not enough, that we need to be worthy. Because but God, Jesus came to show us that we are already enough. That's what the Christ, that's what the cross was for, was for that because we are worthy. He wanted us to know how worthy we are, not because of anything we're done, just because we are his. Because we are heirs to him, that already has qualified us. So stop trying to prove to God that you're acceptable. Stop trying to fight with him and just rest in his peace. Rest in the assurance of knowing that there is, that God has promised this place of rest. And allow your bodies, we have to allow our bodies to be in a place of in his dwelling, in him. In him, in his resting, allowing his, him to be a refuge over us. Allowing, and always, whenever I think about refuge, I think about the eagles. Because the eagles fly high. They fly over the storms. Yes. Because that's where they fly in their comfort. That's where God is comforting. And that's what we have to do. We have to know that when we are in the, the shadow of the most high, that's where we have our peace. Because that's where he's taking care of us. And so Jesus paid the price for our sins. We have his grace. We were saved through God's grace. And so we have to just live in faith by God's grace. And his grace is his power working in us to do whatever we need to do. Yeah. And we have to stand firm on that. I must live by faith in God's grace because of God's grace. I have to live in faith because of God's grace. Yes. We have to start affirming ourselves. Yeah. We have to start That's affirming good. each other. Yeah. Because Jesus paid the price and we're taking it for granted every day when we're not living in this place of peace. Yes. Where we're not living in his rest. Because Jesus said in Matthew, I've come so that you can have life and have it more abundantly. And how sad it is that so many Christians are struggling just to make it through each day. Mm. But yet we have this power. It's because we're not relaxing and we're not living in his peace. Then the last word was release. And so the ultimate rest came to us through Christ. When he told us to come to him, all who are weary and burdened, and give everything, cast their cares upon him. And so we have to release it all to him. It completely, so rest completely comes from him. True peace really comes from him. But we have to rest by faith. We have to rest by trust. We have to rest by surrendering our will to his will, which is the hardest thing. Because again, it goes back to that disobedience because we think we know everything. But if we truly want to have peace, then we have to surrender our will to him. And it reminds me of um, uh, America's Got Talent. The very night I watched that, they had a winner this week. And the winner was a little cute 12-year-old girl for two years and practicing ventriloquism. And so what the ventriloquism is, is her moving her mouth for this puppet. It looks like it's the puppet, but it's really her. That's when we have to be able to live our lives where the Holy Spirit is really allowing them. We're the puppet. We need to start being puppets and allowing the Holy Spirit to talk through us. That puppet can't talk on his own. He needs her in order for him to have life. We need the Holy Spirit in order for us to have life. We have to die just like the puppet is dead because if she wasn't moving it, the puppet would be dead. So when we step over and we die to ourselves, we become like a puppet and we should be allowing the Holy Spirit to move our mouth. And guess what? If you think about the girl, do anybody think she was amazing? Yes. That she was able to sing, to have all these great things, to make other people feel good? That's how the Holy Spirit wants to work through us. He wants to do it in a way that people are like, wow. Yes. How is that happening? Through, like, what, how is that? People should be in awe of our lives. That they're like, tell me how you do that. Yeah. I want to do it. Please show me how. Mm -hmm. Help me. Because it's so powerful that it couldn't be but anything but the Holy Spirit. Yes. So we're in awe watching that puppet because we're like, it's just a puppet. Yeah. How is it able to do that? How is it making me laugh right now? How is it making me cry right now? How is it making me feel good? We should be doing that because the Holy Spirit is working through us. Yes. We release it to the Holy Spirit. Yes. 
And so then it talks about in verse 4, verse 6, in chapter 3, the word today comes in. And it calls attention to at least a couple of applications. First is that there is an urgency, as we've talked about, regarding the matter of rest. It, may, it must be seized when? When do we have to rest? When must it be seized when? Today. Today. Not tomorrow, because tomorrow may be too late. Yes. So we have to realize that we have to take advantage and seize the moment today. Take time to really embrace the moment today. Second, rest appears to be a day-to-day, -day, one day at a time experience. It's not something that we believe for in the moment, but rather something that we believe and lay hold of day after day after day. And so God desires rest for us. It's essential. It's important. Obedience brings us that rest. So if you're not feeling rest, you have to ask yourself, where am I not being obedient? And when we're um, being obedient and when we're believing, we cannot try to believe. Sometimes that comes out of our mouth. I'm trying to believe. Yes. I'm trying to do it. But that doesn't work with God. We just have to believe. Yes, yes. And we have to do it. And we cannot move on. And so if you're having trouble, we have to ask God to work on our heart. Help my unbelief, yes. as the scripture says. That's it. And rest will either be embraced and experienced or it will be lost. It's either one or the other. Can't operate in both. Either you embrace the rest or you're going to lose it. And you're going to lose it and you're not going to be able to enter into the promises of God. And so finally, we have to realize that it's an evil heart of unbelief that falls away from the living God. And only those who are able to enter to God's rest is those who live by faith. Yes. Because unbelief leads to a hardened heart which leads to rebellion and divine um, discipline. And we want to operate in God's rest. We want to operate and live in God's promises. We want to operate and live a life that is abundant. And we want to tell and actually allow our lives to be a reflection of this great God that we serve. So today, are you ready to enter into God's rest? Yes. Yes. Amen. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Wow. Wow.